first time here. No, no, <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I think we'll go ahead and, and get started uh, on time. I hear that there might be thunderstorms coming our way in a couple of hours, so we'll get started on time and end on time. This is a hard, yeah, you can stay here at AEI. You know, we have enough food in the basement to last us for days. That's what they do with us scholars, keep us here for days. That's how we manage to write books. So, um, so I think we'll be fine. Okay. Thank you all for coming this afternoon uh, to discuss negotiating with China during peacetime, crisis, and conflict. It's a real pleasure to have this event here at uh, AEI, to have all of you here with me. What we're going to do today is a number of things. Um, first, I will discuss some of the findings of a recent book that I wrote called The Costs of Conversation, Obstacles to Peace Talks in Wartime. Now, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I am a visiting uh, Jean Kirkpatrick Scholar here at the American Enterprise Institute, and I'm also an assistant professor of security studies at Georgetown University. My research focuses on uh, China security and military issues mainly, as well as coercive diplomacy, and obviously diplomacy during conflict given that I just wrote a whole book about that. So um, I'll talk a bit about what the book says um, and what it means in terms of the implications for uh, managing a crisis or conflict between the United States and China. And then I'm going to turn it over to our two distinguished uh, panelists that I have here with me today. Very lucky and happy to have both Tom Christensen and Susan Thornton join me to discuss uh, the importance of diplomacy and its role in US-China relations. So just as a way of introduction, even though I'm sure that uh, everyone knows both of these individuals here, uh, Tom Christensen is a professor of public and international affairs and the director of the China and the World program at Columbia University. Before that, um, a year before that actually, for many years, he was a professor at Princeton University where doing many impressive things, he also served on my dissertation committee. Uh, from 2006 to 2008, he was Deputy uh, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs with responsibility for relations with China, Taiwan, and Mongolia. Susan Thornton is a retired senior U.S. diplomat who has almost 30 years of experience with the U.S. State Department in Eurasia and East Asia. Until July of 2018, she was serving as the Acting Assistant Secretary for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. And during her experience at the State Department, she has dealt with a number of tough issues, uh, including crises with North Korea, escalating trade tensions with China, and in general, a uh, very dynamic and fast-changing international environment. And working with me. And working with Tom. <laughs> Tom. And then I had to work with Tom. So you see it kind of all, it all, it all cycled down from Susan, I suppose. Um, Susan is currently a senior fellow um, and research scholar at the Yale University Paul Tsai China Center and a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution. And I actually had the pleasure of being with uh, Susan last week in China to uh, have some exchanges and talk about some of these uh, difficult issues, important issues in US-China relations. So to begin, I'm going to provide you with a brief overview uh, of the findings of my book and this research project that I had uh, embarked on probably for more years than I would like to admit. Um, but I think the topic of diplomacy and crisis and conflict is an important enough one to take that amount of time to devote to it. For many of you that might focus on US-China relations, uh, you have probably noticed that a lot of scholars in recent years have noted that there's a higher likelihood of conflict when you have a situation like we have now between the United States and China, in which you have one country that is rising in power and then established great power. IR theorists like to talk about this dynamic uh, quite a bit, but it's not only an IR theory that we're talking about in potential sort of escalation of tensions between the two sides. Policymakers have also noted that there's been this increase in tensions. We are now, uh, according to the national security strategy, in a uh, strategic competition, a great power competition with China. And in uh, my own experience, I do think that the tenor or the tone of the relationship between China and the United States have changed. Uh, I, myself, go back and forth to China quite a bit. I'm a big fan of uh, Beijing in particular and uh, feel like having exchanges with Chinese colleagues can be quite informative in understanding the different perspectives. And for many years, we would have you know, high points and low points in the relationship, but the view was always, you know, how can we get together to talk about uh, you know, fixing the problems that our policymakers are creating for the rest of us. But on my last trip, the discussion actually wasn't so much about uh, you know, that this is a wrong framework or completely wrong and we should move back towards pure cooperation. Um, 
a lot of people were very skeptical that the relationship could return to one that, and that focused more on cooperation than competition. And so because of some of these dynamics, it seems to me that uh, there's a lot of importance in looking at the role of diplomacy in particular. A lot of scholars, um, policymakers, focus on how to prevent conflict. And that is obviously a very, very important research agenda. But given that the likelihood of conflict is not zero, uh, I personally think it's equally as important to try to understand and evaluate dynamics that affect how crises turn into conflicts and how conflicts might be too long or at higher levels of violence than we like. And so because of this, this actually sparked my research agenda because in a time of conflict, something that is so key to keep, in keeping the level of conflict low and as well as keeping those conflicts short is the role of diplomacy. We know that the longer two states refuse to talk to each other, the more likely it is that that conflict is going to continue. But in spite of all the positive effects of diplomacy, in my research, you could actually see that history is replete with examples of leaders refusing to talk to the other side during a conflict. In the Korean War, for example, the US-led United Nations coalition fought for over a year before agreeing to talks. We know in the, Korea, in the Vietnam War, the United States and, and uh, Hanoi fought for almost three years before agreeing to talks. In the Sino-Indian border war between China and India of 1962, talks never emerged between the two sides. And it's probably because they did not talk and negotiate over this border issue that tensions continue to simmer along the border to this day. So in the book, I actually go through these historical examples of decision making of why these leaders decided at various points in time that they didn't want to talk to the other side and what was actually necessary to get them to talk to one another. We have a sense that diplomacy is a complex issue, that there's some meaning associated with your willingness and decision to talk to the other side. Uh, Secret former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said about uh, opening up negotiations with the Taliban, I know that reconciling with an adversary sounds distasteful, even unimaginable. And diplomacy would be easy if we only had to talk to our friends, but that's not how one makes peace. So to answer this research question of after war breaks out, what factors influence the belligerents' decisions about whether to talk and why they might change their minds, I did these in-depth historical cases, and I came up with an argument that seems, I think, pretty intuitive. Uh, but that's kind of what political science is about, is spending years of your life defining variables and measuring things, and then coming up with an argument that I think when I told my parents for the first time what it was, they were like, yeah, everyone knows that. Uh, <laughs> that was a good seven years of your life spent. But, but, I, but I think the, the argument is important, which is leaders are concerned that a willingness to negotiate is going to convey weakness to their adversary. And weakness can be understood in terms of degraded capabilities because of the fighting or weakening resolve to continue fighting or reduced war aims. And they're concerned that if they actually convey this weakness, the outcome is not going to be a facilitated peace settlement. It's actually going to encourage or embolden their adversary, maybe to even increase or intensify the conflict. Because if you're on the other side and you see that your opponent has come to you, but it looks like they're suing for peace, you might think, oh, this strategy looks like it's working. And a lot of times, if you look through history, that's why a country will use escalating force. They want to see, is this going to work? Is this other country going to give in? And so you don't want to give the impression that this type of coercion is successful. And that's why, in many cases, leaders at various points in conflict refuse to talk, because they're concerned that this will actually lead to an escalation of the war, not an ending of the war. Now, you might then ask, you know, how do we ever get countries to the negotiating table if, by definition, all states are concerned about this? And I basically argue that what happens is that states first have to be able to demonstrate through fighting a degree of strength and, and resiliency, such that they're not concerned about conveying this signal, and that their enemy is somehow constrained in their response. And so if you look at the first factor in terms of afraid of looking weak, there's many things a state can do to try to counteract that. The easiest, if you're very powerful, the easiest is to use high levels of violence. Now, I would argue the United States does this all the time. right? Before you, before you offer that olive branch, uh, maybe intensify your bombing first to show, I'm not coming to the table because I don't want to fight anymore. I'm coming to the table from a position of strength. But not all states actually have such asymmetric military advantages. Uh, they have to fight for longer periods of time to be able to show that military pressure cannot coerce them to do things they don't want to do. Uh, 
So that's the first factor is that states are constantly weighing, you know, have I fought in a way or fought long enough that I won't look weak if I come to the negotiating table. Just an anecdote, when North Vietnam um, did agree finally in 1968, in April of 1968, to talk to the United States, the, internally they had decided we're not going to look weak because we had they had just launched the Tet Offensive, which, while it was a tactical failure, um, had led to a surprise in the United States that they could continue fighting at that level. And that was the first time I can see in the, in the documents that the embassy in Saigon, the State Department, Defense Department, Joint Chiefs all agreed when they were asked, did Vietnam come to the table because they're weak? They all said no. So the North Vietnamese at least were right in their assessment. Now was the time to do it. So first, states don't want to look weak. And the second factor is that they're concerned about the escalation of the other side. So if there's some sort of constraints on escalation, this allows for diplomacy. There's many reasons states might not be able to let escalate. It could be they don't have the material capabilities. Maybe you're fighting at full force. Could be that you don't have the motivation. Right? What you're fighting for is not so important to you that you're actually willing to fight at higher levels of violence. There can be domestic political constraints. The domestic public doesn't want to escalate. Whatever it is, when, when there are constraints on the ability of a state to escalate, this actually paves the way for negotiations. So what does this mean uh, in terms of sort of applicability to crises and conflicts more generally and, and, and potentially thinking about best practices in peacetime diplomacy to ensure that we have the right things in place if any conflict broke out with uh, China and the United States? The first sort of main finding of the book is that preconditions are not an obstacle to diplomacy. So a lot of cases when states refuse to talk to the other side, they'll say, well, I'm perfectly willing to talk to you if you meet all these conditions. And the conditions are usually outrageous. You know, it's basically like if the other side completely surrenders and pulls out all these troops and they say I was right all the time and they'll never do it again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these preconditions look on the surface like they're the obstacle to di diplomacy. But in my research, when a state is confident they won't look weak anymore and the other side won't escalate, then they agree to talks, even though in all my cases, none of those preconditions had been met. In one of my cases in which diplomacy did not emerge, China, in the, in the case of the, uh, the war with India, partially met India's preconditions and talks still didn't emerge. And so my interpretation is that preconditions are kind of a stopgap measure. It's something that states can use to really show that they, don't, that they are not desperate to negotiate because they're so outrageous. But once they want to negotiate, they just get thrown out the door. So my first sort of recommendation I have for kind of defense planning is that we shouldn't be spending a lot of time uh, negotiating over the preconditions to whether or not we should talk. Either the timing is ripe and talks occur, or they don't. The second out of the three uh, recommendations I have is about escalation. Now, this one uh, is particularly unpopular when I brief it to defense audiences. But um, escalation rarely, if ever, gets the adversary to negotiate, short of completely destroying their capacity to fight. So this caveat's important, right? If you escalate to the level that you've destroyed the other side's ability to continue fighting, then yes, they're going to come to the negotiating table and sue for peace. But this is a very high standard of, of destruction. I mean, the United States didn't even reach this uh, in the Vietnam War. So it's actually very rare. Short of that, escalating force to try to get the other side to negotiate with you exacerbates these dynamics that I've laid out. It makes the other side even more concerned about looking weak. It makes them even more concerned that you're going to escalate in response. And so what it means is it makes them less likely uh, to be willing to negotiate with you. We know that you know, states don't want to talk under the shadow of the gun and that compellence in general is difficult. A lot of history has told us, for example, in World War II, a strategic bombing that if you target civilian populations in hopes that they will then rise up against their governments to get their governments to surrender, that those civilian populations actually harden their resolve when you target them. And what I'm arguing is that same dynamic exists for governments. The more pressure you put on them militarily during conflict, the more their resolve is hardened not to talk to you. So instead, it's actually much better to think about you know, offering concessions or trying to signal that you are constrained somehow in escalating. And it also really uh, allows for a role for mediators. Third party is instead of just being about communication and information transition, transmission, if mediators can be the ones to actually constrain both sides' ability to escalate somehow, be a guarantor, then that, I think, will allow the two sides to come to the table uh, more often. And this is actually a very important point about escalation, because I think the United States has a historical tendency to have faith in escalation to bring about diplomacy. But there's one other country that I've looked at that has as much, if not more, faith than that, and that is China. In every war that China has fought, 
they have said that disproportionate rapid escalation brings peace. And you might think the last war China fought was 1979, so you know that was ages ago, so I don't need to worry. Uh, but my research shows that they have taken those lessons, and instead of learning it doesn't work, they've decided that it's a good <coughs> way of moving forward, and they've incorporated that type of learning into their broader military doctrine and to some key texts that they te teach their military officers. So I think there's still a very strong viewpoint that this disproportionate rapid escalation leads to peace. And unfortunately, I guess, uh, for this type of mentality on both sides, it does not. And then the last kind of takeaway in terms of policy recommendations I have is about face-saving measures. Now, this comes up a lot with China in general. Um, when I was just in, in Beijing last week, one of the things that came up, for example, a lot about US uh, operations in the South China Sea was you know, this view that maybe the United States has gone too far. You know, that we've humiliated China, so now China has, you know, could never agree to, to compromise on the South China Sea issue, given how far we've gone. Now, we can have a debate about, you know, that's, it's obviously very useful and instrumental for them to convey that message, but I think this brings up this idea of face saving. In conflicts, there's often a debate about off-ramps. If we get to a point of a crisis or conflict with China, how can we de-escalate this? And a lot of it has to do with how do you allow the other side to save face? Now, what my research shows is that states are primarily concerned during wartime about how the adversary, the enemy, will see their diplomatic posture, how the enemy will understand their willingness to talk, not their domestic publics. Domestic publics are important, but in wartime, the most important thing really becomes how the enemy is going to respond to you. So what this means is a lot of times in the United States, we think about face-saving measures as something we can offer the other side so that they can save face in front of their domestic public. But if the primary audience for example, in a crisis is, you know, China's primarily concerned about U.S. perceptions, then us offering a face-saving measure doesn't work because there's a shared understanding that it's kind of BS, right? We've done it to allow them to save face. And so what has to happen is actually those face-saving measures have to come from another party. They can't come uh, from the two sides that are fighting. So these are some of the sort of few ideas, and this is a very sort of hypothetical situation of if you had a crisis or conflict with China, what are some of the things that we need to think about? We need to think about being open to diplomacy from day one and maybe even have a blanket statement now so it doesn't mean anything to say we're, we'd be willing to engage in diplomacy during all crises and all conflicts, not get hung up over preconditions, uh, do not rely on escalation to try to get the other side to the negotiating table, and if you want to offer an off-ramp, you really need to work with mediators and third parties to be the ones to offer that. Now, this is all very kind of hypothetical. I think it's important to think through these uh, in case of any sort of future conflicts. But as you know, today and now, we have a lot of issues and tensions and a critical role for diplomacy in the US-China relationship. And that's why I've invited both Tom and Susan to join me here to talk about how we can think about diplomacy uh, currently uh, in the US-China relationship. So with that, I will turn it over to Tom and have him uh, give some right. of his thoughts on the Well, issue. thanks a lot, Oriana. I, I wanted to say first that I'm very proud of Oriana as a, a former student and advisee, and I really encourage you to read our book. Uh, it's a great example of how international relations theory and actual practical policy studies can be combined. Um, these things are not uh, foreign to each other if they're done right, and I think she does it right in her book. And it's great to be up here with Susan Thornton, who just recently retired from the Foreign Service. There's a tendency in this town to say, you know, thank you for your service to everyone in the military, including Oriana, who's a reserve officer in the Air Force. We don't do it enough for our diplomats. So I wanted to start by thanking Susan Thornton for protecting U.S. national security interests around the world for 30 years. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I had the privilege to work with her, and she's really excellent. I'm really looking forward to her comments. And, um, I wanted to talk about some narratives in this uh, city about U.S.-China policy, uh, basically about the engagement policy and whether it was, quote, unquote, a failure uh, and whether um, we should stop it and do something different. And what I'm going to try to convince you of is that uh, this whole narrative comes out of a misunderstanding of what the engagement policy was uh, across administrations. Um, it always had, as part of the strategy towards China, an element of deterrence and competition. That was always part and parcel of the engagement strategy. And one of the problems that uh, feeds this, this false narrative in Washington is this concept of hedging. And I'll start with that. 
There's an idea that across administrations, the United States China policy has been hedging. And hedging is supposed to be we have diplomatic engagement to encourage cooperation on the one hand, and we have a strong military presence and a series of alliances in Asia on the other in case that diplomatic engagement strategy fails as an insurance policy in case it fails. And this, I always thought, was a terrible uh, concept with a false dichotomy because the strong US military presence in Asia and the alliances in Asia are enabling factors for successful diplomacy. They are part and parcel of an integrated engagement strategy in the region and towards China and always were. Um, uh, it's not simply uh, an insurance policy against failure. It's a buttress for diplomatic success to have a strong US presence in East Asia with alliances. Um, that means uh, you need to maintain those, uh, that strength and that position and that competitive position in order to pursue a systematic diplomatic engagement with China, which I'll argue is necessary almost across the board. And I, I, I'm a political scientist, so I'll start at a conceptual level and say that diplomatic engagement with other parties is necessary under almost all circumstances in international relations. And I think Oriana's book shows this very well, because she's studying limited wars and saying uh, diplomatic engagement is the prescribed outcome, and there are all sorts of hurdles to getting there, but you should have it. Uh, it's, a, it's part of the solution to the problem. Everything but a full-scale war, where the only acceptable outcome is the total destruction of the enemy, requires diplomatic engagement. And those wars are, fortunately, in human history, relatively rare. The vast majority of wars are limited wars over limited, limited ob objectives. Not everything is World War II. Right? Thankfully, not everything is World War II. So even in limited wars, like in Oriana's book, there's still a coercive diplomatic relationship between the adversaries, what Clausewitz calls poli caused, called politics um, by other means, uh, the, con the military conflict. And that means that you need to mix credible threats of further violence with assurances that if the other side offers something acceptable to you, you will not exploit that situation and escalate the war at the disadvantage of the other side. That requires a lot of diplomatic engagement to send those signals, even during war. Then when you get into situations where it's just deterrence short of war, you need to send very credible threats to the other side that if prohibited behavior is adopted by the other side, that there is a credible use of force that will follow. And at the same time, you need to send credible assurances that if the other side doesn't adopt those prohibited policies, that they will not be punished anyway. And if you don't combine both of those things, coercive diplomacy and deterrence being a subset of that will fail. So you need, you need intense, diplomatic engagement, even when you're dealing with a potential adversary that you're trying to deter. Then when you get into the standard problems of diplomacy uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, short of deterrence and, and limited war, uh, economic uh, trade negotiations, law enforcement, consular affairs, you obviously need robust diplomatic engagement, and we do in the US-China relationship. And then there's this idea of seeking global cooperation. We're in a highly globalized world where everybody's policy affects everybody else's, especially with great powers like the United States and China. And if you want to solve problems like nonproliferation, like environmental problems, like counterterrorism, like anything involving the UN with peacekeeping operations, you're going to have to have robust diplomatic engagement with China. You don't have a choice. So it's an absolute necessity for all of these things to have robust diplomatic engagement. So it pains me when I hear the engagement policy has failed. We now need to move to strategic competition, both because we've always had strategic competition, as long as I can remember, with a rising China. And we always will need diplomatic engagement. And to dismiss that part of the equation while you're in a competition with China would be a disaster. But if you just look at the sovereignty disputes on China's periphery, they all require fairly sophisticated diplomatic engagement to deal with from an American perspective. Um, if we look at the South China Sea, uh, we're trying to uh, assert freedom of navigation with China's more assertive pursuit of its long-held uh, claims in the South China Sea. And as part of that, we need to say, yes, we will operate here, but we also need to say we're not taking sides in these disputes where we don't have any claims. 
And that needs to constantly be conveyed to the Chinese that you're not going to lose anything by allowing us to operate here. Uh, with Taiwan, uh, there's a need for a persistent deterrent posture by the United States. I've argued this for a long time. I tried to practice it in, when I was in the government. And that is to signal that the use of force against Taiwan to settle cross-strait disputes on, on the mainland's uh, uh, terms is unacceptable to the United States and runs real risks of US intervention, real risks of US intervention. And at the same time that the United States has to reassure the target, in this case Beijing, that the United States' purpose in maintaining a strong military presence and deterring use of force against Taiwan is not to encourage unilateral changes to the status quo on Taiwan in the direction of independence. If you don't do both of those, you're unlikely to be successful in course of diplomacy. All of that is engagement. People don't think of engagement and deterrence in the same sentence anymore as part and parcel of, this, of the same strategy because of this stupid hedging concept that unfortunately US officials have used all too often. Um, and I return to that. And the East China Sea, it's very important for the United States to be clear. And I think the Obama administration did a good job of this with the president in Tokyo doing it. Make clear that the Senkaku Islands fall under Article 5 of the uh, US-Japan uh, Treaty. And at the same time, reassure the Chinese that the US isn't taking advantage of that position in any kind of way to poke China in the eye on nationalist grounds by encouraging Japan or encouraging US uh, citizens to take provocative positions around the, the Senkaku Islands. On economic in, uh, problems, it's obvious that we need engagement. We have engagement now. So despite the fact that we're supposed to be in a strategic competitive environment, we're engaging China all the time on economic affairs, and I think that's appro appropriate. And it's possible in a trade war that uh, the two sides could fall into the types of situations that Oriana studies so well in her book, where both sides say the conditions aren't right to continue talks. If I continue talks now, uh, that will mean that we've signaled weakness in our trade war. And unfortunately, I think that's where China is this week. I don't know if it'll last, but China's there now. You've taken actions now that make talks impossible. I think that's not constructive. In general, that type of position in US-China relations tends to come from Beijing. In other words, the United States will sell arms to Taiwan, or the United States will sanction some Chinese weapons firm for selling weapons to Russia. And China's reaction is, we won't talk on mill-mill relations, on military-to-military -military contacts, until conditions are better for such discussions. I think that that's not a very constructive approach by China on these issues, but the United States does it as well. So when I was in the government, we restarted human rights dialogue with China in the spring of 2008 after six years of no dialogue under the theory that the United States shouldn't talk to China about human rights until China offers some concessions up front, that they should release some prisoners or they should change some policies before we talk to them. I always thought that that was a bad idea I was glad that we restarted the talks unconditionally in the end in the spring of 2008. And we, talk, we caught a lot of flack for it domestically. Um, but I think that that's the right approach. There's no real cost in talking about these things. And there is some potential value. So why not do it? Um, and both sides have been guilty of that to some degree. And the last thing I want to say is that the engagement policy, as described and dismissed in the current narrative in Washington, and it's a bipartisan narrative. There are plenty of Democrats who are going after the policy, as well as Republicans. Um, the, one of the problems is that the engagement policy of the United States, as I see it, which is a mix of diplomacy and competition and deterrence, has been very successful. And I think Americans have become somewhat whiny about the results of US diplomacy towards China. Uh, Taiwan. Taiwan is a prosperous liberal democracy. None of that would have been possible without successful US engagement and coercive diplomacy towards China on cross-strait relations. Right? The, the sky is not falling. For 40 years. For 40 years. Thank you. For 40 years. Right? More generally, there's been huge shifts in the balance of power in East Asia in China's favor. And China has not used force in anger since 1988 in the Spratly Islands. And it hasn't fought a war since 1979. Most people who know about diplomatic history and military history, if you presented that portfolio, a rising power with a lot of weaker powers on the periphery with which the rising stronger power has 
many sovereignty disputes, and there's been no war, most objective observers would code that as success, not failure. But yet, now everything is crashing down. We need to rethink everything. We need to rethink our strategy because of all the failures we've had in recent years because you know, people like Susan Thornton, with whom I had the great honor to work, and people like me have just failed. We've been naive. We don't understand the problem. And then uh, on WTO negotiations, here's a great one. I will defend, and I don't have time to do it in my presentation, but I will defend in the Q&A, that the WTO TO negotiations with China were a great success for the United States. They didn't solve all the problems down the road that have come up in a highly globalized system. They don't answer all those problems with investment, intellectual property rights protection, all the other things. But for what they did, they did something good, and we need to build on it. But it's been dismissed again across the, the bipartisan divide as a disaster that China somehow got into the WTO. Um, Responsible stakeholder, something that leads, actually, I've heard people snicker in meetings like this when someone says, encouraging China to be a responsible stakeholder, the Robert Zellick initiative of 2005, that it was somehow naive and has totally failed. First of all, it was aspirational. It was China is a big, giant economy. We need to encourage China to contribute to the stability of the international system because if China doesn't, it's very difficult to achieve very important objectives on the international stage. I think all of that is as true or more true today than it was in 2005 as an aspiration. And then I look at specific problems that the United States cares about. Uh, back when I was in the government, Sudan, Darfur, where China, through very intense negotiations with us, diplomatic negotiations, changed its policy on Sudan, Darfur, and the level of violence in Sudan, Darfur went down markedly when China made that change in 2007, uh, in particular the first half of 2007. I got very frustrated at one time where I got really frustrated with the press when I was in the government is China changed its policy on this and the front page of the New York Times had an article that said, where years of diplomacy has failed, uh, Steven Spielberg and Mia Farrow have uh, changed China's policy on Sudan Darfur after we had very intense negotiations on these problems. And China agreed to send the first non-African peacekeeping forces to Darfur in 2007. And that made a big symbolic and important difference on the ground in terms of bloodshed. Um, and uh, Ambassador Natsios, I should say, was really in the lead on that and did a terrific job. On Iran, you might say what you will about the Iran deal. You might not like it. You might like it. It wouldn't have happened without some Chinese participation. Why? Because like Sudan Darfur, Iran is by far the biggest economic partner of Iran. We just have to accept that. If you want to use non-kinetic means to pressure Iran, you need China's buy-in. You have to seek it. You don't have a choice. North Korea, it's more obvious. People know that China is the biggest partner in North Korea, but it's the same thing. You cannot pressure North Korea without the use of military force unless you have Chinese buy-in because China alone can provide enough sustenance to both Iran and North Korea to keep those regimes afloat despite US pressure and European pressure. Um, and that's certainly true for Sudan as well. Um, so to be successful in that kind of diplomacy on these types of issues, you have to do two things with China. You have to present a picture in which you say, your own equities will be worse off if current trends continue the way they, 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 they are in Iran, North Korea, Sudan, Darfur. Your own equities will be worse. You, you'll be in a worse place if you don't help. And if you do help, we, the United States, won't do what you fear most. And this gets to your book. Right? We will not seek regime change. And that's very hard for Americans to accept. And if you don't have those two elements, it's very hard to get China's buy-in in a diplomatic engagement strategy. And I worry about that aspect with Iran today. I do believe we should be pressuring the Iranian regime for its behavior in the Middle East. But if you want to pressure the Iranian regime for its behavior in the Middle East and use non-military means, you have to get Chinese buy-in because China is the biggest investor in the energy sector, the biggest purchaser of energy, and the biggest seller of consumer merchandise to Iran by a lot. You have to get Chinese buy-in. You're not going to get Chinese buy-in if our elites, our officials, our academics are saying the only acceptable outcome 
is the demise of the Iranian regime. It's just not going to work. So you have to decide whether you want that to work or not. And I return to my earlier point, that it's only in worlds where the total destruction of the enemy is the only acceptable outcome, and those situations are relatively rare, that diplomacy and engagement are not necessary. And the vast majority of international relations, including the vast majority of wars, are not such circumstances. They are circumstances where deals can be cut and need to be cut. And Oriana's book does a great uh, service by showing that diplomacy and engagement is almost always the best option. The question is, what are the obstacles to getting there? And she does a great job of uh, exposing that. I've spoken for too long. You know, I served in the government. They let academics in the government. We're still academics. We talk for too long. And I want to turn it over to someone who actually knows what she's talking about, uh, <laughs> Susan Thornton, uh, my, my former deputy and someone I uh, was very proud to try to advise on occasion when she was in a higher level positions. And I knew she would get promoted when I left. I knew she was going to be a star. So. <laughs> Well, thank you, Tom. I'll turn it over to Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Tom and Oriana. I have to say to all of you that I was so excited when Oriana asked me to come and do this. I try not to come to Washington too often these days. I live in Maine. Um, but uh, you know, I was really excited about her book, her book launch. So proud of her. And when she told me that Tom Christensen was going to come do this with her, I was like, oh, I'm definitely in. So it's a great chance for me to have a, a mini reunion with the two of them. And even though I was with Oriana in Beijing last week, um, it's great to share the stage with both of them. And I'm so glad that the conversation up here, even though it starts with kind of wartime, and Oriana's cases are all about sort of ongoing limited conflicts, as she said. I mean, I think it's so important to bring up that distinction about total war versus limited wars. And, you know, total war has almost, I mean, it hasn't happened in my lifetime. Um, and I'm not that young anymore. So, you know, is this really something that, you know, we can think about as being very realistic? So it does point to the incredible di importance of diplomacy in even in wartime. And coercive diplomacy has become, I know, very fashionable. And I think I like to start my remarks. Do we have any diplomats in the room? Raise your hand if you're a diplomat or were a oh. diplomat. Um, I was a diplomat. <laughs> yeah, so we have a few. Um, you know, diplomacy is very unfashionable in this town. And it's not totally a function of the current administration. Um, but I have to say, Oriana, that there's a big difference between what you talk about in your book and another book I've read about negotiating, which is The Art of the Deal. Um, you know, it, it, it is not fashionable. It's, I mean, I've been reading a lot about this lately because um, you know, I have a lot of free time on my hands now. And I've come across a lot of really wise quotes and things from former leaders, um, former American leaders who I really admire. So one of them, one of my favorite presidents is Ike Eisenhower. And he says, you know, someone was trying to tell him, you know, how to do something with some foreign country, how to negotiate or how to, you know, what kind of pressure he should use. And he said, I know something about leadership, and I know something about dealing with nations, even nations with whom we are at odds. And let me tell you, you know, you're not going to hit them over the head with a stick. Any damn fool can do that. That's not how I lead, and that's not leadership. Leadership is about persuasion, patience, bringing them along. And he said it takes a long time, and, uh, but that's the only kind of leadership that I am willing to participate in. And you know that's from a guy who was not a wimp, let's just say. And I think um, when we think about diplomacy, I mean, what is diplomacy? What is required? You know, you, you're talking a lot about sort of face and issues that have a big impact and, and resonance in domestic politics. And I think we shouldn't overlook, right, the factor of domestic politics in all of these issues. It's it hangs heavy in the balance in the United States. But you know, we seem to believe um, that other countries don't have politics. And that's a fundamental error that we often make. Um, other countries have legitimate interests. 
So doing diplomacy with another country first requires that you be able to recognize that another country has a legitimate interest in something. And hopefully you can also recognize that you have an interest and then you can come together and try to figure out how your overlapping or common interests can be pursued, hopefully through negotiation. I'm not even talking about coercive diplomacy at this point. This is just normal diplomacy where we talk to people and try to solve problems. And you can do that. You don't have to threaten people every time. You know, sometimes countries are happy to work with us, believe it or not, and work on solving common problems. Tom mentioned a whole bunch of them there. And uh, it wasn't the case every time that we had to threaten the Chinese about some kind of sanction or some kind of you know, military incursion that we were going to make if they didn't come along with us or uh, follow our will. So uh, you know, it's stunning to me the extent to which we have somehow come around to the view that it is not fashionable to talk to people to try to solve problems anymore. Um, but that's what we used to do at the State Department. Um, my assignment today is to talk about diplomacy with China in the Trump era, and you notice I don't have many notes. Um, you know, it's because we're not really doing any. We're not doing diplomacy with China. We, um, you know, people make fun of it now. We had a lot of uh, dialogue set up with the Chinese on all manner of issues in the Obama administration, 60 plus dialogues on everything from you know, non-proliferation, nuclear smuggling, uh, biotechnology developments, pandemic disease, climate change, you name it. And we had technical experts talking to each other, cyber, uh, crime, everything. Um, those are all not working now. We're not talking to the Chinese now about any of these constructive areas. Um, and you know, the thinking now in the administration is that this was all a waste of time. What good does it do to talk to the Chinese? They just tap, tap, tap us along. Um, you know, as Eisenhower said, these things take time. It's not super conducive to a four-year presidential election cycle, unfortunately. So that's probably a disadvantage for us, actually, in international negotiations. But, you know, the idea of America, the global leader, who has the sort of most soft power and the most persuasive model and ability to get other countries to, you know, we don't have to compel them. They want to go with us. Um, and the idea that we're sort of squandering that now and not using it to its maximum extent is, is really um, kind of stunning. And I, I, I see, you know, in the media, and all over this town, this kind of herd mentality against diplomacy. And uh, I really think it's very regrettable because as that happens, you know, first of all, we're teaching other countries very bad lessons about diplomacy, especially China. You know, the more we threaten and bully and uh, think that we have to use some kind of uh, nuclear ICBM weapon equivalent in the economic sphere to get them to come to the negotiating table. I mean, at some point, you know, what gets done to them can get done to us. And this is not a good model for the future of international uh, discourse. It's not a good model for solving problems in the international community, in the global sphere. As, as Tom mentioned, all of these common challenges that we have. I mean, I go around now and give talks about sort of US-China relations. And the thing I always say is, you know, do we really think that a lot of our problems that we're going to face in the future are going to be bilateral US-China problems? Because it hasn't really been the case you know, since um, the mid-90s, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, that most of the problems we were involved in were bilateral problems. Most of the problems have been global, kind of transnational problems that we've been facing. And why would we think in an increasingly globalized world that that will not continue to be the case? And we're talking about one-fifth of humanity here, um, you know, and a very uh, sort of strong dynamic economy and a very strong and efficient, not d democratic, but efficient, uh, you know, set of governing institutions in China that can bring to the table resources and other things. And we might not like everything they do, and we can have a conversation with them about that, and we do do that. Uh, but you know the idea that we're just squandering this opportunity to kind of leverage, you know, another potential diplomatic 
um, arrow in our quiver is, is, it just seems very, very uh, negligent to me, frankly. Um, now, Oriana talked about sort of issues of face and how we get leaders to resolve problems, um, especially if we're in a contentious situation. I mean, certainly being in a military conflict is about the most contentious situation you can find. But we're in a pretty contentious situation right now with China. And my understanding is that we are in this kind of standoff, exactly like what you describe in the book. Basically, both sides are refusing to take the first step. And um, you know, we see one side escalating pretty rapidly, pretty dramatically, um, thinking that you know that's going to bring the Chinese presumably to the table. And you know, what I know about China um, and the degree to which they care about face, um, you know, that might not be what I would have recommended, frankly. Um, but you know, here we are, and we'll see what happens. But I think it's a lot more productive to think about doing what you have in your book, which is, you know, why are we setting up these kind of standoffs? Why are we setting up these contentious situations? Why is everything a coercive battle? I mean, I maintain that, you know, we've had trade negotiations going on with China the entire time I've been working on China. It's a mm -hmm. constant battle. It's a constant pulling and tugging and hauling. Um, eight years of the Obama administration, we did this. You know, we got some progress on some things. We uh, were in the midst of negotiating a treaty on bilateral investment, so we were making a pretty good progress on that negotiation when the administration ended. Uh, so we never got the treaty, and we never got any of the things that we had been negotiating for all those years. Uh, but you know, we were making progress on a lot of things, and you know, this is iterative. It's not going to change the uh, structure of the Chinese economy overnight. People who think that that's how trade negotiations work, it just doesn't work that way. Um, you come up with problems. You know, all these tech problems didn't exist when, we, when they joined the WTO. So I think you know, it's, it's delusional, frankly, the way we've approached this trade negotiation. And it's out of, it, not in keeping with any of the history or any of the, of the sort of way we've done this in the past. And I don't think it's that surprising that it hasn't gone extremely well, frankly. Uh, but. Um, We'll see. I keep my fingers crossed and hope it's going to somehow come back, come back together. So I think we all should hope for that. But um, I know there are going to be a lot of questions. So I will leave it there. And thank you all for coming, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for your comments. I think, uh, and this again is just on a personal anecdotal level, but thinking about the importance of diplomacy and exchanges. You know, before last week, I spent nine days talking to about three dozen. Uh, Chinese scholars, military leaders, analysts on the South China Sea. And I would say that my position before I showed up there in China was pretty harsh. Um, I thought, uh, you know, I was like, there's no room for compromise on this issue. And I had a hard time seeing it from their perspective. And through those exchanges, while I would say um, that we still have a lot of areas of disagreement, I think my position has softened a bit. And in particular, that's why you shouldn't go. That's why I shouldn't go. <laughs> it doesn't do any good see, to go talk to the Chinese. I, I think what it means is so we had this exchange specifically in the South China Sea. And I don't want to get into too much of the boring details about the legalisms of the South China Sea. But it came up to an exchange of I said, you know, if China is willing to concede on this, I'm sure the United States would concede on this other fact. And the Chinese I talked to said, we are more than willing to concede on that issue, but there's no way the US is flexible. And then I came back to the United States, talked to some of our leaders, and they said, we are more than willing to concede on that. But I'm sure China would not no. concede on that. Right? So I think there is some, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't chalk up you know, a lot of the tensions, or the majority of the tensions, or cooperation on misunderstanding. I, I believe that a lot of the issues are actually that we understand each other quite well, and that is the problem. But there are still areas in which I'm sure there's misunderstanding about what the two sides' positions are that if we engage with each other Pretty more. Pretty big misunderstanding right now on trade, I think. Right. A lot of miscommunication. But. Right. The miscom Yeah. So it's, it's not, I don't want to say every problem between the two are because we don't understand each other, but it, it cannot hurt to talk to each other. So um, to play a little bit of devil's advocate, to ask one question before we open up. Oh, well, you're going to ask a question? I'm going to ask a question. Wow. Uh, moderator's prerogative, right? Is uh, one thing that I hear a lot about diplomacy and negotiations with China is, one of the reasons we shouldn't do it is that China doesn't live up to their commitment. 
And I'm curious, this has come up, this is not exactly the same thing, but with the South China Sea issue, Xi Jinping, you know, promised the president he wouldn't militarize the islands, and he did militarize the islands. Like, how can we, if we even come to some sort of a re arrangement or agreement, you know, how can we trust that the Funny, the Chinese said that last weekend to us. How can we know you're going to live up to your they commitments did. when every four years you get a new president, you're going to overturn everything like exactly. you did They did, time. they did. There so was, we do have a there credibility was, There was problem, the Iran deal, there was the WTO, yeah. there so, was so, the Paris Accord. So, Remember the Paris Accord? So besides the fact that maybe right now we can have a whole debate about the United States and whether or not we live right. up to our commitments. Um, but China. But if, yeah. but what, you know, and some people, I'm not an economist, so I don't know about the WTO, but some economists would say, you know, they made promises to reform on a certain time and oh. didn't reform. So oh, no. what yeah. would you say about some of those? No, it's a, pro it's a problem when China doesn't live up to its commitments, and that's part of diplomacy, is to try to come up with a, a, a set of diplomatic arguments and maybe leverage uh, to show why that was a bad choice on their part. But you don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. And uh, the, the, the problem with diplomatic commitments is you, you tend not to notice when the other country complies with them. So you mm -hmm. tend to get a, a list of the non-compliance mm -hmm. areas. And you say, mm -hmm. see, they're just lying to us all the time. But you really want to look at the whole diplomatic relationship and see all the areas where you know, there, there weren't breaks. And you also have to be a little bit self-reflective, especially now. And, when I said the WTO, I meant that the United States tariffs on China and on Europe and on, on Korea and Japan initially were probably not WTO compliant. In other words, we decided to not live up to our own commitments to the WTO. So it's not only China that violates it, but if, if you want to stick with a WTO framework, which I think would be a good thing as a foundation, not as an endpoint, and then build on there something like the TPP, which I think was a good idea that's now been abandoned by both parties, um, and as a way, and when we started to negotiate the TPP when uh, I was in, in the Bush administration in the last year, and the idea was to create a higher level agreement on economics. It wasn't really trade, it was investment and IPR protection, uh, national treatment for foreign companies, uh, fighting subsidies, things like that, that we create a very high standard for the members of it. China would get jealous of not being a member, and China would open up its own economy in a way that would help not only the other members, but also China itself, and it would be a giant win-win outcome. That was the initial TPP negotiation. Then it became caught up in a, a term I really don't like, the pivot. It got caught up in that, and it started to look like, uh, as according to uh, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter, an aircraft carrier, which it was never designed to be. Um, it was some part of a strategic leverage thing. So I just think the solution to non-compliance is pressure to get them back into compliance, but then to try to push deeper agreements that solve some of the problems. A lot of the problems that we have with China today on so-called trade issues aren't really trade issues. They're about subsidies to state-owned enterprises. They're about IPR protection or the lack thereof. Um, they're about uh, forced technology transfer for investors. These types of issues are not really trade issues. They require deeper agreements than the WTO allows. But the solution to that isn't to scrap the WTO. It's to try to deepen it through bilateral investment treaties and other things. So yeah, there's non-compliance in the world. But it's not, that's not something that should be front page news. That's something that's just a challenge for us to wrestle with. Maybe Steven Spielberg should solve that issue. There you go. Let's get Steven Spielberg or, yeah, or, just or a little, Rodman. Uh, just yeah. a little bit of moral opprobrium, and that's yeah, it. That's it. A bad that's country. It. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think IP, intellectual property protection, is a great example. And, and by the way, um, everyone agrees that we negotiated the toughest WTO accession agreement with China that we've ever negotiated, and that, it, and that the provisions that were in there were really, really um, Pretty, pretty tough. The, I think we did fall down a bit on, um, you know, in the in the immediate sort of post accession kind of eight year period where we were distracted by a couple of things going on in the Middle East. We and we wanted China's help in the international coalition against terrorism. We did not bring as many cases probably um, that as we could have under things like dumping, countervailing mm -hmm. duty, subsidies. We could have done all of that under their WTO accession agreement and should have done that. And we just didn't do that, I think, um, as much as we could have. I mean, we started doing a bit more, uh, and then we had the global financial crisis. But then after that, um, we started doing a bit more, but I think it, we didn't keep up. The other thing, though, is on IP. So 
intellectual property protection violations used to be a bit different, right? It was like knockoff purses. Yeah. It was name brand They're still there. Uh, stealing, you know, patent infringement, copyright infringement. It was, I remember con congressional delegations coming over and talking about pirated movies, yeah. pirated uh, yeah. CDs, you know, music. Um, you know, but when it sort of morphed into the, it kind of got, uh, conflated with the whole cyber espionage issue and the issue of separating out, you know, how much is being stolen, commercial secrets, how much is being stolen, national security information, how do we feel about that, how is that, how are we dealing with that? It became much a, a much harder issue to, to, you know, have sort of focused thinking on and focused approaches when when the national security elements started creeping into intellectual pro prote property protection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I say one thing about WTO? I said I'd, I'd mention in the Q&A that before China joined the WTO, and China did join under stricter restrictions than any developing country had ever joined in the past uh, because of the negotiating uh, position of the United States, which was rather tough. Before China joined the WTO, the US economy was wide open already to Chinese products. So the change in the United States to China's accession to the WTO was very, very small. The U.S. was wide open already. What the WTO accession did was open up China to U.S. products in a way that it wasn't open before. And that's why U.S. exports to China grew faster than U.S. imports from China in the period after the WTO accession. Yet, for some reason, there's a bipartisan consensus in this country that WTO accession of China was somehow a disaster. And I just think that's wrongheaded. I don't understand the logic. Now there's cheating, there's no question there's cheating. That's what you have to deal with, right? There's been cheating. Um, and there's cheating with the spirit and there's cheating with the letter and there is an adjudication process for that and we ought to use it. And we should celebrate when the Chinese use it against us. I think that's true in a whole range of things. When China raises WTO cases against the United States, we should say, great, because now we can defend ourselves on a rule-based system with an adjudication process and show whether you're right or wrong. And you should get used to doing that rather than doing shady deals and doing things under the table. That should be a, a, a celebratory moment. But it isn't treated that way. It's treated as, who are you to call us cheaters? You're cheaters. Now let's just punish you, and you can try to punish us, but we can punish you more than you can punish us. And you know what happens when people punish more than the other side? Both sides get punished anyway. Like even if you win a fist fight, you break your knuckles. I guess, yeah. I've yeah. had many fist fights lately, so I'll take your word on that. <laughs> Lucky for the other guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, well, hopefully this has been uh, an interesting conversation, has raised some questions uh, in your own mind. So I think now we're going to take uh, the remainder of the time to field questions from the audience. We should, I'm looking back at Isabel to see if we are going to have a mic coming around. Uh, when you raise your hand, when you get the mic, please introduce yourself and then as much as possible ask a question. We convinced them all. Here in the back. Thank you. Uh, hi, Tao Huang, Nankai University from China. And now I'm uh, the Fulbright Visiting Scholar at Georgetown University. Mm -hmm. And um, my question is, given the so-called bipartisan consensus towards China, and how can we uh, bring the diplomacy back? Um, we can raise one example is now the 5G and the Huawei issue, uh, which had uh, roused uh, a quite furious debate inside China because the, a lot of Chinese people, they are using the Huawei cell phone and because of such kind of things, you know, a lot of ordinary Chinese people, they got a very tough idea towards the United States. And to my understanding, United States is losing its legitimacy and the, even its soft power uh, inside China. So what's your comments about it? Start with an easy one, Huawei uh, and... Uh... You want to start? Yeah, I'll go. Um, so my recipe for how to get things back on track is not an easy mixture to make, but we have to get this short-term trade deal that was on the books, 150-page long document that we almost got done. We have to get that done. 
somehow we have to get these two people back together and, and, and finish that. Hopefully by the time of the G20 in June, we should, the U.S. should um, join the Belt and Road Initiative, whatever that means. I don't think we need to sign any piece of paper, but we should not be um, active detractors of China's attempts to push out infrastructure into the Asia-Pacific region. And I know some U.S. companies are already participating in some of those projects, but they're not talking about it because it's out of favor in Washington. I don't see why that should be the case. This should be something that everybody um, can get on board with and uh, participate in. And I think that that would help ease at least some of the feeling in China that the U.S. is against every initiative that China is trying to propose even initiatives that we have been encouraging them to propose under the responsible stakeholder a few years ago. So there's probably a little bit of confusion in Beijing also over this. We could help to uh, sort of dispense with that. And then I think, um, you know, if we can do that, then we need to sit down and have some serious conversations about um, some of these technology issues and how we're going to live in the same world where all of our citizens use technology you know, two times as many cell phone users in China as in the United States and a growing market. Um, I know U.S. companies don't want to be bereft of that market. And so, you know, we do have to figure out how that this is going to, how this is going to work. Um, I don't think there are any real conversations going on about that now. Yeah, I would just say that, in, you know, in the trade war, um, the, 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 Complaints of the Trump administration about China, I think, are all real. And they've, they've been there for a long time uh, across administrations, going back to the Bush administration. But they really got worse after the financial crisis. China really did disappoint even the people who negotiated that WTO negotiation when they were dealing with someone like Zhu Rongji are saying they were promised by their counterparts in China, that China would continue to marketize and move away from reliance on state-owned enterprises and state banks, et cetera. And since the financial crisis, China has moved in the other direction. So the problems in China are real. and The Chinese public should know about that. They may not. So the, the tensions are not just caused by US policy. Um, how you deal with those tensions is another matter. And that's where we may have a difference in, in our approach from where, what the US government has adopted. But the, the problems are real. I think the most difficult problem in all of the economic discussions is 5G and Huawei and ZTE. Um, and I can't go into any detail, but Huawei has been on the radar screen of the United States government for quite a while as a, as a, as a bad actor. You can look at public reports that make various uh, claims about what Huawei did in the past, going back to the early 1990s as, a, as an economic actor and uh, potentially violating UN Security Council resolutions and things like that. So that, that's an old issue. But the newer issue is 5G is so powerful. And I know that Mr. Ren, the, the leader of Huawei, has tried to reassure the world that he is a, owns, runs a private company. He has no in, incentive or an intention of cooperating with the Chinese government for national security purposes to use his uh, very formidable technological assets for espionage and other purposes. But at the end of the day, if you understand contemporary China, and you've seen previous examples, he has absolutely no way of preventing the national security establishment in China from using his company for its purposes. And the example that I think of is from when I was in the government was Yahoo in China. Yahoo made the mistake of keeping its email information databases in China, stored in China. And the Chinese Ministry of State Security demanded that Yahoo, a private company, turn over its data to the Chinese government. They resisted for a while. What are they going to do? There's no rule of law in China that would prevent that database from being transferred. And it was transferred. And dissidents were arrested and given very long prison sentences. And the leader of Yahoo testified on the Hill and was all choked up and upset while one of the relatives of one of the arrested uh, dissidents uh, was behind him. I don't see how Huawei, as a Chinese company especially, could avoid that kind of treatment at the Chinese government. So even if Mr. Ren is totally sincere and he's a great business, he's obviously a great businessman, right? If he's totally sincere, he can't make credible guarantees 
that his infrastructure around the world won't be used for purposes for the Chinese government because he has no legal rights. And that's a systemic problem in China. And I'll be just frank about that. Up here in the front. I was going to say you put it much better than I have put it in the past. You know, but I think that there is a fundamental difference in our in our systems that make it difficult, um, you know, for Americans to trust yeah. that those types of. So there's the Apple. There's a case of the I, the, the Apple I iPhone. The San Bernardino case. Yeah, the San Bernardino case yeah. where Apple, as a private company, was pressured by the U.S. government to give a code to break the security on the phones, and they said no, and they won in court. Okay. That that's not going to happen in China. Right. That's the difference. That's the difference. Yes, please. You know, you know, in, in the discussion. Sorry, if you could introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. First. My name is Philip Ellison, uh, Grapevine Development in Los Angeles, California. Um, when we were talking earlier about bilateral negotiations and, and diplomacy and how that's problematic right now, and and then we raised the issue of a WTO and the multilateral world that mm -hmm. that's you know shaped by and and adjudicated through. Um, I'm wondering in the case, say, for example, of Huawei and, and, you know, the 5G issue, you know, one of the big successes really of the 1980s and 90s was, in, at least in Europe, the establishment of the GSM standard for mobile telephony mm -hmm. and a, a sort of a broad, you know, broadly negotiated standard. Sh should we be thinking about something like an IAEA mm -hmm. for cyber war? You know, in other words... We're not talking nuclear weapons. We're talking, mm -hmm. you know, cyber weapons. But should there be some multilateral agency that goes in and says, "Hey, have you put, have you dropped spyware into this infrastructure uh, system and you know done that sort of thing?" You know, so that we have a sense that this is a global issue and these are global installations that we all use. Right. So if I, I'll just say a, a quick word before I turn it over because I I've done some writing on this issue. And this comes to our interpretation of where the problem lies. I mean, my interpretation is right now there are, when you see problematic Chinese behavior, I don't see China as trying that, that they go against the international order, try to revise the international order. In a lot of cases, I see that that order is non-existent. That we're, there's many areas in which we're working in which that order hasn't been established mm -hmm. yet. And that actually our response shouldn't be the order isn't working, so let's pull out of it. But instead say build. we need to build areas of international institutions, but also consensus over norms. Because in some areas when there aren't consensus over norms, China is also working very hard to ensure that those norms are established that are more favorable to them. So, so I personally think that, that that is kind of the direction to go to try to get everyone to the table to agree to a set of you know, rules and standards of behavior, um, going back to you know, cyber, whether it's cyber-enabled economic espionage or cyber uh, that affects national security, uh, and that hopefully our future diplomats will expend a lot of effort on those things. But that's also something that's not very sexy right now in Washington, is talking about uh, building, building and contributing more to the international order than we, we are now. I'm really curious to hear how Tom answers this question. But I will just mention that in the Obama administration, we had conversation, we had a multilateral conversation at the UN in the global group of experts on cyber warfare. And we had, I mean, the China, we had a bilateral dialogue also with the Chinese. Um, I don't know if the U.S. is still participating at the GGE, but definitely the bilateral dialogue with the Chinese is not happening. But there we were mostly focused on how to get a um, set of norms that would be agreed first, we thought, with China, and then we could introduce it to the larger group. And probably if we and the Chinese could agree and get, also get the Russians on board, then that would be palatable. And it was around things like um, agreement to not um, attack critical infrastructure, not use the uh, what's called the computer emergency response team, where we send messages back and forth to warn each other about attacks and things, not not abuse those for um, for warfare, um, and a number of other a couple of other norms and. Um, basically, you know, we're at the very beginning stages of talking about this. I mean, the de definition of critical infrastructure, once you get intelligence and military agencies involved, gets ever, ever, ever expanded until it includes everything. And that's really your problem. How do you, that's really the problem with cyber in general, is everything is dual use and everybody's using it, including militaries, including uh, intelligence agencies. So 
you know, I, I would love for you to flesh out that idea and write an op-ed and see if you could get any traction. But the problem I see, frankly, is I don't think intelligence services are going to be willing to reveal to anybody what they're doing in cyberspace because they've found this to be such a fruitful area for exploitation. And um, I just think that's, that's kind of, it's a very difficult conversation to have, even with militaries, but I don't think intelligence agencies are going to have this conversation easily. And it's even difficult in the civilian sector just to have standards for internet use, right? Yeah. Um, and we have a big difference with China on that. We have a big difference with a lot of people on that, this, this country. I, I support our position of an open internet but uh, a lot of countries don't, and certainly China doesn't, and they want national sovereignty standards. Um, so that's a big challenge. But I, I would encourage what you're, what you're suggesting. It, you know, one of the things about those types of initiatives is they're inexpensive to attempt, and they can potentially create uh, partial solutions to problems that wouldn't otherwise be there. And one of the problems with criticisms of diplomacy is uh, it's along the lines of the violations uh, argument which is that uh, if you solve pr pr problems partially instead of not at all, you've made an achievement, right? And the, the, the standard of diplomacy <laughs> is everything has to be solved fully and every, everything has to be totally copacetic from a US perspective. Otherwise, diplomacy is a disastrous failure. And what I always say is, what's the alternative? Is this outcome, by talking to them about these things and trying to get some level of cooperation, worse than not talking with them at all? And usually the answer to that is no. Usually. Sometimes it could be worse. Maybe sometimes your paranoid leaders are right that talking signals weakness. But, um, but in general, it's relatively cost-free to send, especially if you do track two, you send academics. You know, they fly economy. Right. You know, you send them in. Yeah, and especially if you're in the United <laughs> States, because no one thinks we're weak, right? I mean, to be honest, in the international community, that is not how we're viewed. Right. So if we're the first ones to enter into talks, I mean, it's not usually that they think that it's a sign of weakness. It's usually, to be honest, what we heard from the Chinese academics, they were like, oh, no, here come the Americans again. What do they want this time? You know, we're going to have to listen to them and engage in a dialogue with them and give them something. Um, wish they would just leave us alone. I mean, that, but that's what we're giving up. I mean, it's basically free to us to get these gains. Yeah. Um, you know, a little eye roll, look of annoyance, but usually they'll come along and we'll accomplish something. And it's, and it's the cost of a plane ticket, so it's very unfortunate that we're not doing this. Yeah, definitely need to do more of it. Let's go up here. Especially on the norm stuff, you know, talking about persuasion. Yeah. Maybe we don't have a whole institution that defines it, but if we have different norms on internet governance, we should be doing more to try to convince others. To adapt our yeah, and actually it. the Chinese are making a lot of the norms right now, standards exactly. on 5G and other things in the internet space because we're not really participating. Exactly. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Michelle Munger. I'm a future student at Brandeis. So my question is, how do you make the argument to people not on Massachusetts Avenue that Eisenhower's principles of patience and persuasion are the, through diplomacy are the way to achieve things for the long term? So how do you make that argument to regular people? Well... You know, you add to the Eisenhower side of it, Eisenhower wanted a very strong U.S. position in the world, both in terms of alliances and military presence, that affords you the opportunity to be patient. So one of the problems is this, uh, one of the many false divides, I think, is a sort of hawk-dove divide uh, in this town. And I think you can appeal to people who consider themselves relatively hawkish if you can convince them that the payoff for a strong position is successful diplomacy, patient, successful patient diplomacy, that is, uh, is facilitated and allowed by that strong position. And one of the things that people don't, that a term people misuse is uh, deterrence or coercion. Usually people who lean to the hawker side like deterrence. But what they don't accept is that Deterrence is not the use of force. It's a mixture of threats of the use of force with assurances that if the other side complies with the demand, that force won't be used. And that all requires diplomacy, patient diplomacy. And if you can convince people who like deterrence and they like a muscular posture that a big part of what they're proposing involves patient diplomacy, then you can get a long way. 
Um, and I don't think that, that there are that many doves who really want the United States to be extremely weak in the world. I, I'm sure there are some, but um, I don't think that, uh, that uh, that's a real recipe for not using US force. And for that, I would use the example of the 1930s. The last time America was really weak was when we weren't engaged with the world, we didn't have allies, we had a closed trade policy, and we had discriminatory um, uh, immigration policies that helped our enemies rise to power in foreign countries. And that led us to fight to theater a giant war. So if you want to prevent war, I would say you got to be out there, you got to be strong, and you have to couple it with diplomacy. I think that's a winning argument. I don't know why it's hard to win with that argument, but uh, I'm a Groucho Marxist. I never, I, you know, I, I couldn't join a party that would have me as a member. Um, so I'm, I'm an independent and I'm a radical moderate. Uh, that's where I fall. And I would just add, you know, as being someone that studies conflict, right? So I usually raid on everybody's parade. But you know, this type of thing is also important. Working with third party actors is. And, and engaging in this kind of diplomatic efforts is so important if you're in a conflict. The United States can't do anything militarily in Asia without our allies. You know, what are we going to be doing? Like operating from the west coast of the United States? It takes us, I think. It's a big ocean. It takes it's us like, ocean. you know, what I think I heard the other day, like 15 days or something to get across. You're not fighting a war if it takes you 15 days to move stuff across. So even, even if you were very hawkish and even if you said, you know, I'm more, I, I'm more willing to accept risk than somebody else in terms of a conflict in Asia, then your number one priority maybe isn't 100% diplomacy with China, though it should be, because you know, knowing your adversary would also be important. But it definitely is engaging in good diplomacy with every other country in that region. So no matter how you look at it, whether you know, obviously you want that diplomacy to avoid conflict, deter conflict, and you would be better poised if conflict actually happened if you had good diplomatic relations. So I think across the board it's important. I don't know if you have any I answer. think this is an excellent question. Excellent question. Uh, I've been dwelling on it a lot myself. Um, so I think that the American people outside the Beltway have got this. I think that's the signal that they keep trying to send through the ballot box, but nobody's listening. <laughs> I think they want you know, us to end all of these military Turn conflicts and take up a more kind of um, measured, patient, and low-cost approach equals diplomacy, right? But for some reason, uh, you know, if you look at sort of the constellation of forces in this town, it's very hard to... Um, to change the, the kind of prevailing narrative. It's a media narrative that, that um, you know, feeds on kind of the drama and the buildup and the march to whatever the next conflict is, coercive, is kind of high profile and sexy. And I think, you know, what we need to do is make diplomacy sexy again, but I don't know how to do that, obviously. Um, so, but maybe you all can help if you have some ideas on that score. But, I mean, we've got to make kind of the divided media scene that we have here kind of unite behind getting behind some kind of you know more rational low cost patient and wise solutions to some of these challenges and i think that's what the american people want actually yeah. yes up here hi um my name is ariella beals i'm shadowing lindsay weiss here um so in february there was um recently um a congressional hearing talking about sort of the U.S.'s role globally and specifically in relation to China. And so one of the things they touched on was that the um, trans-Pacific sort of trade deals didn't Pardon. really yeah. go through successfully. And so um, one man brought up ARIA, which is sort of like a new move to have some sort of structure regarding um, trans-Pacific relations. A lot of what you've been talking about throughout the course of this has been sort of softer diplomacy, soft power moves, including like establishing norms, building up international institutions. But hard diplomacy tends to be what's more in favor in this administration. Mm -hmm. What are some existing or things that could realistically be put into, what are some, or sorry, what are some institutions that could realistically be put into existence to build upon these things, to establish these norms okay. in an environment that doesn't really favor soft diplomacy. 
Well, it's the last part that's the challenge. I don't know about soft diplomacy. There can be hard diplomacy too, but diplomacy is different than shooting, right? So that's, that's yeah. the real difference. Um, you know, again, I, on the trade, the so-called trade issues, they're really economic issues. If you look at the list of complaints by the Trump administration against China, I think those are real complaints. Again, they're not new, most of them. They're long-running problems in U.S.-China economic relations. Many of them exacerbated, not really created, but exacerbated after the financial crisis of 2008. Um, and if you look at the list, a lot of those issues are the types of issues that were wrestled with in the TPP negotiations. And I would just say that it would be better to approach China from a position of strength, that's not soft, right, from a position of strength, if we were approaching China with 11 other partners in the region with very big GNPs, cumulatively, um, and then try to make the same kind of demands. And so uh, one potential solution which would be for us to follow the lead of our very good ally in Japan, our very strong ally in, J in Japan, Prime Minister Abe, and re-engage with the TPP and engage China with the other 11 partners and say, here's what it would take for you to join. You're welcome to join. This isn't a containment policy. You're welcome to join it, but you'll have to make the kinds of changes that the Trump administration is now trying to negotiate with China bilaterally, except you'd be bringing a lot more leverage to the table if you had 11 partners with you in China's neighborhood. So it's not a question of whether the problems aren't real. It's a question of whether you agree with the particular approach that we've adopted to deal with the problem. And again, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be overly critical of the Trump administration here. I was really disheartened as an independent in the 2016 uh, election uh, and as a, as a lifetime free trader, uh, here we are at the American Enterprise Institute, right? Um, a free trader that both parties abandoned the TPP as some kind of horrible deal. And both sides, bo both sides criticized China's accession to the WTO, which was a free trade, uh, a form of free trade progress, as a negative thing. And it seemed like nobody in the American political spectrum anymore believes in deepening integration of the global economy which I think has demonstrably reduced global poverty, has demonstrably reduced interstate violence, and has demonstrably created more leverage for the richest, most technologically advanced country in the world, the United States, on the international stage than almost any other factor. But again, I think my compatriots have become whiny about the realities around us. They only see the negatives. And somehow everything I just described has been a disaster, an unadulterated disaster, all of these integrated globalization processes. And I understand that our people are get hurt by these processes. We need to do a better job of helping those people. But we shouldn't stop the processes that have brought all those positive uh, outcomes in the past because we haven't found a way to help our own citizens who've been left out of the process. I would just add, you know, when you think about what's hard, like right now with the South China Sea, because that's what I focus on, you know, the United States hasn't really invested in trying to find diplomatic solutions, not between China and the United States only, but between all the, all the claimants. Like, I'm not necessarily advocating this, but it's like we could have shuttle diplomacy, make it a huge uh, priority, you know, South China Sea peace process type of thing, and really encourage all the claimants to come to some sort of resolution. We don't do that, I think, because it is extremely hard. But then at the same time, we spend a lot of time and effort thinking about the, the, the military operations that are going to have to be conducted to potentially protect our allies in this situation. That is also not a great solution, also very costly and also very hard. So I think at the same time, while the United States, and I think rightfully so, is you know, reiterating its commitment to defend you know, the Philippines, for example, if that's the direction we're going in trying to increase the deterrent against China to be more aggressive in the South China Sea, we should be expending as much effort in trying to deal with this, this issue diplomatically. So I don't even know. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't call that soft diplomacy. And I, I don't know. Susan might say, it's I don't just think. Just diplomacy. And just, I don't, how about just diplomacy? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Drop the know, adjectives. I don't know if any <laughs> diplomat would even want to take that on, maybe because of how just hard it is. But the, you, you raised that point, and I think it's worth making the point that only the United States could do this. Only I mean, we States are the that. global leader. I mean, it's amazing to me when you see what's happened to um, the U.S. position in the global and international system where we've retreated 
nobody's really, I mean, people say China wants to take over the international system yeah. and change it. They want to take over the world. They're not eager to step into that role. Europe is not stepping into that role. You know, other countries are not stepping in. And Ian Brummer writes about the G0 world. I mean, that's what we're kind of faced with right now. If the U.S. isn't leading on the global stage, I mean, people are used to us being there. They're used to us coming up with the ideas. They're used to following us. If we're not there, you know, no one's moving in. And this is just a tragic lost opportunity for us. And we can do shuttle diplomacy. We can do uh, norms and come up with new institutions. We can do all these things. They're very low cost. Um, it's what people kind of expect. And uh, there's no block to us doing that except our own current psychological uh, fear of talking or something. Right. So I think, you know, this is the thing I think also the American people understand in addition to sort of we should get out of wars and start doing low cost diplomacy. They want the U.S. to be the leader of the world. They want the U.S. to be the global leader in the international system. So, you know, these are a lot of sort of cues that are coming through that no one's listening to in, in, in sort of our current posture anyway from what I can tell. Okay, I think we have time for one more quick question, a quick round from the panelists, and then we'll conclude. Thanks. Uh, you're an online journalist. Um, so given the situation that the, chi uh, the U.S. and China are not on good terms today, and it's hard to imagine that things could be improved shortly, um, what do you think are the foreseeable consequences for the two countries? Impacts on the two economies, but maybe probably on other aspects. Is there a cost-benefit analysis in this? Uh, Thank you. I, you know, I, I don't know if I can predict the future. I'm pretty sure I can't. Um, it's not good. It's not good for the U.S. economy. It's not good for the Chinese economy. I understand the argument that the Chinese economy is likely to be hurt more by a trade war than the U.S. economy. I just don't understand why that would be considered a victory for the United States if the U.S. economy is also being hurt. Um, I don't think we're in a full-scale, zero-sum relationship where uh, Chinese pain is, by definition, U.S. gain. Um, so I don't see a lot of good things coming out of a persistent trade war uh, between the two sides. And one of the things that I think a lot of Americans don't realize is that we're in bilateral trade negotiations. They're not really, again, they're not really trade negotiations. They're economic negotiations with China. Right? But everything that we do in those negotiations is impacting all of Ch China's neighbors in a very deep way, including US friends and allies. So I was in Taiwan in uh, January of 2019, and I was really struck. I asked uh, people of all different ideological stripes, real elites of all different ideological stripes in Taiwan, all different parties, whether they thought it would be a good thing if the U.S. trade dispute escalated from 10% to 25%, the big, the big package. right? And I was really struck that the deepest green of green commentators in Taiwan did not want to see that happen. Mm. Because all these economies, this is a highly integrated system that was created through trade negotiations, through technology. <laughs> There's a very highly integrated economy in East Asia of transnational production chains. And when the US and China fight, Korea gets hurt, Japan gets hurt, Taiwan gets hurt. And I don't think a lot of people really fully digest that. So I don't see any real victory in the claim that, yes, the US is being hurt by the Chinese, uh, US-China trade or economic conflict. Um, but China is being hurt more, so yeah. don't worry. I, 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 I just don't get that. Again, I return to the stupid analogy, the, the high school analogy maybe. You know, if, you, if you get in a fight and you, you do all the punching, but you end up with a broken hand, was it a good idea to get into the fight? I feel like there's a lot about Tom's past that I didn't yeah, I know. know we need to research this. this. And sort of a, a final concluding note, I would say that the consensus seems to be both in Beijing and Washington that things are going to get worse before they get better. I, whether or not that's true, obviously diplomacy plays a very critical role in ensuring that even if things get worse, they don't get so bad, and ensuring that we can 
recover from this and ensure that the relationship does get better and we can move forward. I, I want to say one more. It's a great question. I just I came up with another, another answer to your question, which is the things that the Trump administration is demanding in the, trade, in the negotiations with the economic negotiations with China are legitimate demands. And if China were to adopt policies that were consistent with those demands, China would be helped. The Chinese economy over the long run would reform itself in a, in a pro-market fashion that would produce more Chinese wealth. So that would be one outcome. The second outcome is if China adopted the policies that are being demanded, the US and China economies would be more integrated, not less integrated. Because it would be easier for American investors to invest in China, not harder. So you'd have more integration and, ex and a more economically more powerful China. So I, I think if we had more integration and a more successful Chinese economy under those terms where China's marketizing its economy, that would be a good outcome for both countries. I don't know if the actual people involved in the process in the United States really want to see that sure. outcome. And that's why it's so hard to guess what the outcome, you asked about the future, what, what's, what's the future gonna, gonna hold? Because I think the United States does have tremendous leverage. And I think the Trump administration has shown that the United States has tremendous leverage in this negotiation process. But for what purpose is the le leverage being used? What is the end game? Is the end game to integrate more, to open up more, to have more trade, more investment? Or is it to appeal to the fears of some Americans that globalization is the enemy and we don't want to integrate more with China, we want to decouple? I can't tell. So we haven't been able to answer all your questions this afternoon, you, but I'm, hopefully um, <laughs> some of them. Thank you all for coming. And I do think I there might be, I'm looking back, at if, there might be books on sale outside. Are there books there are. On, there are. Yes. So there are books on, books sale, on sale outside, outside if you'd like to grab a copy. And I'll be, I'll be hanging around here a little bit if, if uh, you do grab a copy and, and want a signature. Um, get home safely. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. I keep hearing the warnings. The warnings are coming in, so. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah. You, you know, know, grab a book in case warnings. you get stuck waiting for I mean, your or something. You'll have something to read. Thank you all for coming, and let's give a round of applause to those comments we've been. Great question. Yeah, so you did good. Success. Different standards of success, you know? Uh, uh, Ooh, thank you. I was wondering if you could sign a book for me. Yes. Yes. My pen is.